Algebra 1 Common Core. This is the June 2016 Regents exam. Uh, this is the first video in a series that uh, I'm not sure right now how many videos it's going to take, but I'm going to try to keep them to about 10-12 minutes each to cover the entire uh, June 16, um, June 2016 Algebra 1 Regents exam. So let's get started. Number 1, the expression x to the fourth minus 16 is equivalent to what? This is a factoring question. Uh, it looks like a factoring question. Uh, you can see it's got the double parentheses from there. Uh, you definitely got to be familiar with the types of factoring you're going to see here. Um, trinomial factoring, there's difference of two squares factoring. Uh, GCF is really the first thing you should look for right away. Uh, is there anything in common between these two terms? And there's not. Uh, is it a dots? Is it a difference of two squares? Well, there's a subtraction. A subtraction means difference. So that part's check. Are there two parts to it? Yes. And are they square parts? 16 is a square number. So that's a square. And x to the fourth is square. Um, when it comes to the exponents, we just need even exponents for a variable to be considered to be a square term. So this is a dots question. And when it comes to dots, it factors to double parentheses like we see here. And basically, you do the square root of each term. And it's always 1 plus 1 minus because they multiply to a negative. So plus, minus, 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 rule that out. Plus, minus, 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 rule that out. But 1 plus 1 minus, and really, the only thing that I can really trip you up here is what's the square root of 16? It is not 8. The square root of 16 is 4. Now, you're going to have a lot of time to take these regions exams, three full hours. So a question like this, you know, might as well check the work. And what you could do is simply distribute, kind of work backwards. Factoring is basically dividing. Distribu distribution, distributing, is multiplication going the other way. So if you take this answer, you think it's x to the fourth plus four and x to the fourth minus four, and you distribute it. x to the fourth, uh, x to the second times x to the second is x to the fourth. x squared times negative four is negative four x squared. Four times x squared is positive four x squared. And four times negative four is minus 16. You have additive inverses here, which cancel each other out, and you're left with x to the fourth minus 16. So you could have confidence, you have the right answer. Number two, an expression of the fifth degree. Now, I, I tell my students this all the time. The two most helpful test-taking strategies, and if you're one of my students watching this video, you're sick, probably sick of me saying this, is to circle key things in the question and then read it again after you answer the problem. So right away, an expression of the fifth degree is something worth circling is written with a leading coefficient of 7. A leading coefficient of 7, meaning the first coefficient is 7, or the coefficient of the highest exponent. Now, a fifth degree means that the highest exponent is degree. A constant of 6, a constant is a number that doesn't have a variable attached to it. So a constant of 6. This is a constant of 7, a constant of 5, a constant of 5. This is a constant of 6. So right away, I'm pretty sure the answer is D, but let me check the other pieces to it which expression is written correctly for these conditions. So is this a fifth degree? Yes, the highest exponent is 5. Is the lead coefficient 7? The coefficient of the term with the highest exponent is 7. So yes, that is my answer. And again, kind of sift through the question. Read it again to yourself. Make sure you answered it properly. But rereading catches a lot of mistakes. But circling key things in the problem is probably the best thing you could do. Number three. Let's skip to one. Number three. The table below shows the year and the number of households in a building that had a high-speed broadband internet access. Number of households, year. Clearly, the first thing I'm recognizing is that the number of households is increasing as the year increases. It's a positive correlation. For which interval of time was the average rate of change? You will 100% have an average rate of change question. It appears every year. An average rate of change is nothing more than slope. So which interval has the average rate of change the smallest? That's important because a lot of times they're looking for the greatest average rate of change. So basically, I'm looking for the smallest change. You know, for, so you know, how did it change? I mean, you could do slope, but on a question like this, I think you can kind of just see because this is, you know, two year difference, two year difference, two year difference, two year difference. So they're all over two years. So what was the increase from 2002 to 2004? From two to four was 11 to 23. Let's see, that's uh, 23 minus 11 is, oops, sorry, that moved, um, 12. All right, so that had an increase of 12. How about from 3 to 5? That's 16 to 33. 
33 minus 16 is 17. So that's larger. We're looking for the smallest. 4 to 6, 23 to 42. 42 minus 23. Remember, we're doing the second minus first because that's slope. Your slope formula is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Now, all of these would be over 2. Maybe subtract these that are over 2. So they're all over the same interval of time. So that's why it's easy. We're just looking at the y values. So uh, 42 minus 23, uh, what is that going to be? That's going to be 19. And you might even kind of guess that we show that it's increasing. And if you know, you know, society, uh, technology is growing rapidly. So I expect the increase to be smallest in the beginning. So I'm suspecting the answer is A. But I'll check the 5 to 7 just to be sure. 33 to 47. 47 to 33. That's a 7 and 7. That's a 14 difference. Uh, so it actually kind of slowed down a little bit there. But the smallest was definitely the 12. That's our smallest rate of change. Number four, scatter plot below compares the number of bags of popcorn to the number of sodas sold at each performance, uh, at each performance of the circus over the week. So, you know, take a look, kind of understand the chart here that, all right, like here we had 200 bags of popcorn sold and about 200 sodas sold, you know, right there. This one is we sold about 400 bags of popcorn and we sold you know, about 425 sodas. It seems like the more popcorn we sell, the more sodas we sell. This is a positive correlation. But let's see what this question is asking us. What conclusion can be drawn from the scatter plot? There is a negative correlation. No, we just said it was positive. There's a positive correlation between popcorn and soda. Absolutely, but let me check the others. This is what I would call a true-false question, where one of your answers is going to be true and so on. So I like to make little T's and F's next to them. So this is a false statement. I believe this to be a true statement, but I'm not going to stop there. Because if I keep going and get another T, well then maybe I'm reading the question wrong or I'm doing something wrong because I should only have one true statement. Uh, and sometimes you'll catch mistakes that way. There is no correlation. That's not true. Buying popcorn causes people to buy soda. That's kind of tough. I mean, that could be true or false. I mean, there's not evidence here. You know, causation is a little bit different than correlation. You know, um, does this prove they're related? Yes. But does it prove that more popcorn causes more soda? Or could it be that buying more soda causes people to like, you know, you kind of suspect maybe that's true, but I don't think there's concrete evidence here to show that. If this was like, you know, amount of gas in the car and the distance it could drive, then yeah, you know there's a causation there. There is a relationship here, but, you know, is there a rule that the more popcorn you buy, the more soda you have to buy? Uh, you know, not really. So I'm going to say false there and go with my initial choice of B. Um, now, this is a po how do we know this is a positive correlation? Well, if I draw that line of best fit, this is a positive slope. It's going up and right. You know, sometimes I call it an incline or it's increasing. Like as we, you know, I read this sentence and I write words left to right. It's the same way you got to read graphs. You start here on the left and you travel to the right. As we travel to the right, we're going up. That is a positive slope trend. You know, and that's what a positive correlation is. You know, no, a, a negative correlation would be like if we saw things kind of, you know, on their way down, that type of thing. Um, that's not what's happening here. Uh, this is definitely a positive slope. No correlation is when the dots are all over the place and you really can't make a line out of it. You know, you don't see a positive trend or a negative trend. It's just a, a mess. Number five. The celluloid cinema sold 150 tickets to a movie. So they sold 150 tickets. Some of these were child tickets and the rest were adult tickets. A child ticket cost $7.75. So that's $7.75 for every child ticket. Notice that like I stopped mid-sentence to kind of make sense of what I was reading. It's important to do that too. Because a lot of times students just read this whole thing and they're like, wait, I don't understand any of it. Let me go back and read it again. You know, it's okay to pause and kind of digest the information a little bit. An adult ticket cost $10.25. So for every adult, $10.25. The cinema sold a total of $1,407 worth of tickets. Write a system equation. It could be used to determine how many adult tickets is going to be A and child tickets is going to be C. Now, we already said that it's um, $7.75 for every child ticket. So I would expect $7.75 to be on the C. 
right? 775C, not 1025C. So that rules out these two options here. Then the adult tickets are 1025, 1025, good. So the only difference between these is one is A plus C equals 150, one is A plus C is 470, and the other one, you know, which one should be equal to 150 and so on. So A is the number of tickets sold. So A is number of adults tickets sold. C is the number of a, a child tickets sold. So A plus C is the number sold. And we're told here that we sold 150 tickets. Now the reason why this one is equal to 1470, because 1470 is what the cinema made. And they're making 1025 for every adult, 775 for every child. So they make this much money, sell this many tickets. Let's, uh, where are we on time? All right, we're about 11 minute mark. How about we'll stop it there. We'll pick up with number six in the next video. See you.